welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in this episode I have Jorn Tremelin who is joining me today to talk all about muscle protein synthesis. He has a master's in nutrition and health, he actually got top honours in his studies and he's now pursuing a PhD in muscle metabolism so he is definitely an authority on the topic and this episode is very informative and detailed. But before we get into things, a few updates. The Optimizing Body Composition seminars with Sigma Nutrition and Danny Lennon have officially commenced. Uh, We've completed our Melbourne seminar and we are now heading to the Gold Coast, Sydney, then Ballarat, and finally Perth. Tickets for those events are available. And if you want to learn how you can devise a system to enhance fat loss and muscle growth, and you're in Australia and you want to learn more from us and Danny, be sure to check it out and we hope to see you there. Also, if you didn't know, JPS hosts and teaches the Certificate 3 and 4 in fitness for young up-and-coming fitness professionals wanting to gain their qualifications to teach and educate in the realms of personal training. So our next course begins in April and if you want more details on that I'll put a link in the description box below. It's not your ordinary uh, personal training course, there's a bunch of additional content and curriculum that we have specifically added to ensure that the standard of our personal trainers coming through the certs with us are at a very high level and uh, guaranteed success when they do enter the field. And finally, the Ultimate Evidence Based Conference in Melbourne this June is fast approaching and tickets are going like hotcakes. We've sold a number of early bird tickets. We've actually sold out of the early bird tickets on the three day pass. So if you want to get your hands on a ticket and save plenty of dollars before the prices go up once early bird tickets are sold, I recommend you check it out and get yours today. I'll put the link for tickets and details in the description box also. So in today's episode, Yon and I talk about protein synthesis, the different fractions of protein synthesis and which are relevant to muscle growth, the role of training in altering muscle protein synthesis, the impact of each training variable on protein synthesis and some nutritional tactics we can use to optimize muscle growth. We also discuss some of the factors that can impede protein synthesis and have a look at the research relating to hypertrophy and some of the weaknesses in such studies. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, be sure to like it, take a photo, share it on social media, tag myself and Yawn, and enjoy. All right, so Yawn, welcome. And before we get into uh, the nitty gritty of protein synthesis and everything uh, muscle growth, uh, do you want to give the listeners a little bit of a background as to yourself and why, I guess, you're the man when it comes to muscle protein synthesis? Yeah, so my name is Joran Trommeler. Uh, I work at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, one of the biggest labs in uh, human muscle metabolism. So our main focus is on muscle mass and the factors that regulate muscle mass. So that's mostly exercise and nutrition. So we do uh, some pretty big long-term training studies uh, in which we assess changes in body composition. But what we're best known for is uh, measuring muscle protein synthesis. So that's uh, the main process that's driving muscle growth. Um, So we can do both acute studies where we look how a single meal or a single training session impacts muscle protein synthesis and then how that over the long term impacts muscle growth. Um, Well, why am I out dirty? I don't know. I'm just trying to do a little bit of science. That's all uh, I bring to the table. Um, I I dislike the word authority. You hear it like a marketing term everywhere now. Uh, Everyone brings their own piece of experience uh, to the table, whether it's the hard gainer, whether it's the world champion, whether it's uh, the guy who reads all the blogs, the guy who writes all the blogs, the researchers. And hopefully together we come to a good good understanding of what works and what doesn't work. But... uh, I don't consider myself an authority. I just have an opinion, and hopefully, uh, together we come uh, to some productive workouts. Yeah, man, you're a very humble man. 
And I, I like that uh, definition of authority because I think you're right. Everybody uh, does have an experience, and their experiences, uh, you know, can help uh, the totality of what we do and don't know uh, when it comes to you know building muscle. Um, but before we get into uh, things further, let's lay the foundations and I guess discuss what muscle protein synthesis is and. If you want to explain the difference between, you know, total body protein synthesis and then uh, protein synthesis at the, uh, you know, f fiber level, um, and then we can go from there. Yeah. So um, the building blocks of muscle and most tissues in our bodies are proteins. Uh, muscle protein synthesis is simply the process of adding more proteins to those tissues. So when we're talking about muscle tissue, uh, it's called muscle protein synthesis. And a simple analogy is that uh, your muscle is like a wall. Adding bricks to that wall would be muscle protein synthesis. Uh, it makes the wall bigger. However, at the same time, uh, all your tissues, the wall is always uh, being broken down and that process would be muscle protein breakdown. And uh, both of these process, processes are always happening. So it's not like, oh, you're in muscle protein synthesis mode and now you're in muscle protein breakdown uh, mode. It's the difference in speed between those processes that determine the balance and whether or not uh, your wall or your muscle will grow or will shrink. Now in that analogy, muscle protein breakdown sounds like the bad guy because, well, it's shrinking the wall, so to speak. However, again, if you use that same analogy, if you want to build the biggest, strongest wall there is um, and there's cracks or damage to that wall, do you want to continue to pile up more and more stones or do you want to first break down the little cracks, repair those, and then on that strong foundation keep, uh, keep building? It's the same thing with muscle physiology. Um, so you can't do this in humans, but in animal models, uh, if you uh, breed animal models so that they have, uh, well, dysfunctioning muscle protein breakdown, those animals are actually smaller and weaker than normal mice. So muscle protein breakdown is an essential process for training adaptations. It's not really an enemy. Um, however, muscle protein synthesis is the good guy. You really want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis as much as possible, and that will optimize uh, exercise recovery and in case of strength training, uh, muscle growth. Oh, and then for your uh, second part of your question, um, so protein synthesis happens in, in all your tissues. Uh, we know a lot about uh, protein synthesis in muscle because uh, a muscle biopsy where you take a little piece of muscle is relatively easy. How it happens in other tissues, we don't really know, but we can measure uh, whole body protein synthesis. So that's just the average of whatever is happening in your body. Um, I don't really like that measurement. It's relatively easy. Uh, I have it in all my studies because it's just a little bonus with little effort. Or at least relatively little effort. So I wish it was great because I would bump out 600 studies a year. <laughs> um, but the problem there is, especially for athletes, like in more clinical populations, it, it has some relevance. Um, an athlete wants bigger muscles. Um, so if you look at how much protein do I need to feed that, that whole body uh, protein synthesis goes up, you have no clue what is happening and where. And then people like to assume... Uh, well, if some tissue has higher protein synthesis, that must be a good thing. Well, for, for a muscle, I know exactly what protein synthesis uh, is and what it does, and that's functional. But if you get more protein synthesis in your gut, is that a good thing? Or does that result in what's called the, the GH guts that uh, the Mr. Olympias have, for example? If you have a thicker skin, uh, figure of speech, it's good, but like for bodybuilding, is it good? Is your hair growing faster? Like what is happening? You have no clue where that protein synthesis is happening and whether or not that's a good thing. So I think we should look at uh, our training and uh, nutrition recommendations should optimize muscle protein synthesis and whether or not whole body protein synthesis uh, is optimized, I think that's of less of a relevance because again, you have no clue what is happening, uh, where and whether or not that's uh, useful. And an another whole discussion is that 
the way you measure whole body protein synthesis, I think, uh, of course, I'm biased, but in our lab, we have the most expensive and probably the best method to do it. I'm pretty skeptical how other labs do it. So half the papers you read on whole body protein synthesis, I don't even really believe them. So there's just a bunch of issues with it. Uh, I would much rather have people just looking at the muscle protein synthesis studies or the long-term studies, but not the whole body protein mm -hmm. uh, metabolism studies. Yeah, first, I really like that analogy. I think it's a, a brilliant way to conceptualize the process of synthesis and breakdown. And yeah, I agree that the distinction between muscle protein synthesis um, and total body protein synthesis uh, you know, is one that needs to be made. And I think a lot of people may not necessarily be aware of, which um, can be problematic if they're reading research um, and trying to use that research to guide their practice. Um, so moving forward, what is the role um, of resistance training in uh, stimulating or initiating uh, this protein synthetic response. Yeah, so everything that your listeners kind of know about building muscle mass, those same principles will apply to muscle protein synthesis because, again, it's the main mechanism that results in muscle growth. Um, so exercise is the most potent uh, stimulator of muscle protein synthesis, uh, nutrition, and then specifically uh, protein intake is also potent, but a lot less strong than uh, training. We can get into it later. Uh, hormones have some impact, but at the physiological level, it doesn't matter that much. If you take exogenous hormones or steroids, uh, that will have a gigantic impact, of course. But training-wise, uh, you simply see that uh, after a single training session, muscle protein synthesis depends a little bit on the training status of the individual as well as probably the training volume. Um, but you can see that muscle protein synthesis is elevated for up to 72 hours, um, which is pretty in line with recommendations of hitting each muscle group at least uh, twice a week. Uh, other than that, all the factors that you think about when designing a training program, such as volume, rest periods, all those things have been uh, studied, uh, uh, what the muscle protein synthetic response to that is. And all that stuff is pretty in line. So doing multiple sets results in uh, a bigger muscle protein synthetic response than just a single set. Training to failure, at least very close to failure, will give a, a bigger or protein synthetic response and just uh, well an easy set let's call it like that um, uh, short rest periods reduce the muscle protein synthetic response not entirely clear what the mechanism there is maybe it's just because you can do less reps on your next sets because you rest less but regardless uh, you see that short rest periods reduce the response and in long-term studies you see that short rest periods reduce muscle growth so it's relatively easy to remember everything that works in the long-term studies seems to work pretty well in the muscle protein synthetic studies as well. Awesome. And you mentioned that training status or how advanced somebody is um, as well as volume can influence the muscle protein synthetic response. So do you want to potentially talk about um, you know, why these two factors can alter the, the magnitude of MPS that we see uh, you know, through resistance training? Yeah, so it's an area I wish that would have been studied more. So let me say up front is that um, the nutritional side of this is much more advanced than the training side, simply because a lot of companies are interested in funding nutrition science, while there's not really any company that can earn money on training science. So a lot more, I, I would say that the training field is a lot more developed, oh, sorry, the nutrition field is a lot more developed. I think we know a lot there. Uh, the exercise side, we we're, we're relatively have little to work with, but um, so there's a few things. Um, when you're untrained um, and you train, you see a very big increase in muscle protein synthesis. That's kind of what you expect. Let's call it noob gains. Everyone knows that if you're uh, uh, if you're untrained, you make your best gains. But there are a few catches to that. Um, just as we discussed uh, the whole body protein synthetic response, 
um, that you can divide it in muscle protein synthesis and different tissues. You can divide muscle protein synthesis in subcategories as well. So you have myofibular protein synthesis, and that is what we're really interested in. So that's protein synthesis of the contractile proteins in muscle. Those are the ones who produce uh, force. Uh, so they make you bigger and stronger, and that's really what we're interested in. You have mitochondrial protein synthesis, collagen protein synthesis, sarcoplastic protein synthesis. Those are have relatively less to do with, let's say, strength sports. Uh, what you see is when someone's untrained and they do a training session, all those subfractions in the muscle, they think like, what the heck is happening? We've never been under this stress. And all these fractions uh, are increasing their protein synthesis rate. So the myofibular protein synthesis goes up. The mitochondrial thing, like this is the first time we ever had to work. Let's call it metabolic stress. Uh, you, your tendons are not used to it. So collagen is increased. Everything is increasing. So the total muscle protein synthetic response is very big. After a few weeks, you see that that total muscle protein synthetic response is uh, a lot smaller. But what's interesting is that the myofibular, so the one we're interested in, is it isn't actually that much smaller. Uh, it's these other fractions that are not really related to, let's call it bodybuilding, strength sports, uh, such as your mitochondria that are no longer increasing in response to resistance exercise, which makes total sense. Otherwise, strength training would make you an endurance athlete. So after a couple of weeks of training, um, you see that your what we call mixed muscle protein synthesis, so you don't look at any specific uh, fraction, that becomes lower, but your myofibular, the one we're really interested in, actually doesn't become that much lower. It's a little bit lower, but not not that much. So um, people who don't really know that distinction have kind of over-exaggerated that after a few weeks of training, uh, you hardly see any increase in muscle protein synthesis anymore. That's just incorrect interpretation of the data. Another factor uh, that comes into play is that in untrained subjects, uh, they have a lot of muscle damage uh, when they train. So that's not necessarily protein breakdown. Uh, it's just muscle damage, and that damage needs to be repaired. So even though uh, in an untrained subject, the increase in muscle protein synthesis will be the highest, uh, a lot of that muscle protein synthesis is spent on repairing muscle damages. So you're kind of spinning your wheels because you have a lot of protein synthesis, but you're just repairing all the damage that, hap that happens. Uh, the difference between those two is of course still positive, otherwise they wouldn't gain. But if you just look at the muscle protein synthesis response, you would overestimate how much they're gaining. And then after just a few weeks of training, after four weeks of training, progressive training, I should add, um, you already see that muscle damage has gone down quite a bit. So after four to 10 weeks, most of the increase in myofibular muscle protein synthesis uh, can actually be, stand, uh, be spent on muscle growth and not, I, I don't wanna put a percentage on it, but most of it is spent on growth rather than on repair that you see in like the first one to three weeks. So uh, just looking at muscle protein synthesis as a whole, not as su at a certain subfraction, can give you the wrong interpretation of data as well as not taking uh, muscle damage into account. But that is mostly in untrained subjects because again, after just four weeks of training, uh, which any anyone who actually trains laughs about, <laughs> uh, you already see that muscle damage is uh, super low. But unfortunately, most studies are still done in untrained subjects. So you do have that uh, have to take that into account when you look at these training studies, and you see that uh, the muscle protein synthetic response after training, after one training session, doesn't really trans doesn't seem to translate that well to muscle mass gains in the long term. But after that four weeks, when most of that damage has gone, uh, then it translates pretty well. So muscle protein synthesis studies in untrained subjects who do exercise for the first time, they are a little bit itchy, but if they're slightly more trained than completely untrained, uh, they're very legit basically.
Awesome, awesome. And in regards to volume, let's uh, talk about how the acute training va- variables, you know, that you mentioned earlier. So uh, volume and then like training to failure, which would be uh, intensity of effort. Um, how these apply, um, you know, in practice to initiating, um, you know, the pathways that you know alter our muscle um, and muscle protein synthesis uh, balance. So, how does volume and intensity uh, impact MPS? Yeah. So, uh, what's important to note is sometimes you hear people talking about triggers with muscle protein synthesis. I don't really believe in triggers or I shouldn't say believe. There's no there's no triggers. Uh, muscle protein synthesis is just a very sensitive dial to whatever is happening. So you see if in studies we just let people do, we, we let them reduce their step count, which is basically, you can't even call it exercise. Uh, they just take a little few, fewer steps a day and you already see that muscle protein synthesis goes down. If you just do one set of exercise, it already goes up. But if you do multiple sets, multiple sets it simply goes up more uh, so at most things that's diminishing re, re, uh, returns so your first set gives you like a, a, a relatively big increase in muscle protein synthesis then three sets has a pretty good additive effect on top of one five does reasonable better than three but adding more in a single session is just diminishing returns so you see that muscle protein synthesis goes up uh, quite a bit more and it less the total muscle protein synthetic respon- uh, response is a little bit longer in duration, but the main effect is that muscle protein synthesis goes up more. So it's not that you can do, uh, let's say, 50 sets, which would uh, uh, Mike Isretel would even be impressed with that. If you, you, can, you can't do 50 sets and then say, oh, now I've activated muscle protein synthesis for two weeks but if you do five sets it might be uh, elevated for a day more than if you just do one set for example Um, so that's the volume uh, variable Uh, intensity in the sense as percentage of your one repetition max doesn't really matter Um, so Stu Phillips has done uh, a lot of these studies Uh, as long as a set is to failure or close to failure you essentially uh, recruited uh, all your muscle fibers and you'll get the optimal muscle protein synthetic response and it doesn't really matter how you arrive at that point so rep ranges are pretty much a tool to exhaust the the muscle they're not a target so whether you do a a heavy three repetition max or uh, let's call it the bodybuilding rep range 6 to 12 or you do 30 reps still failure uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference between that. So just one way that has been expressed to uh, to quantify training volume rather than the very traditional uh, sets, care, reps, times, load, uh, is just the number of challenging sets. And I think that's a pretty good uh, measurement. So the muscle protein synthesis studies also confirm that it doesn't matter which with which load you train as long as the set is tough and then how do these how do these variables interact with the training status that we uh discussed earlier so uh one one theory that has been popular is that based on that trained subjects have a shorter muscle protein synthesis uh response to training that trained athletes should uh train more frequently because, well, if the response lasts shorter, you have to stimulate it more often. Uh, again, I think that is misinterpretation of the data because specifically for that myofibular protein synthesis, that shorter duration isn't uh, that well uh, uh, characterized. But more important, perhaps more frequent uh, training sessions uh, would stimulate MPS more often. But what if you simply do more volume? Because I can imagine that three sets is a lot for an untrained subject but for a trained subject it's like you're warming up Mm. so to speak so i'm skeptical that uh if you do 15 sets in one training session that would destroy an untrained subject but i maybe that's needed to get 
the same muscle protein synthetic response, the same height and duration an untrained subject would get with like three to five sets. So I'm not saying that an increase in training frequency is not going to help. It's probably going to help, but I think other uh, training stimulus, such as simply increasing the volume, will do the same trick. And how you distribute that doesn't matter that much. So I think there's reasonable evidence that you probably want to hit muscle groups at least twice a week. Other than that, I don't think frequency matters that much. Frequency is just a tool to make your, let's call it, weekly volume practical. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, I guess uh, it's important to understand that the duration of MPS, um, that it's elevated above baseline, is what's, I guess, important when we look at how many times a week we should be training a muscle. Um, and now that we've sort of discussed some of the training variables and how they uh, play a role in stimulating muscle protein synthetic response, um, when we get out of the gym, what are some nutrition tactics, funnily the name of uh, your company, uh, what are some nutrition tactics that we can employ um, to help augment uh, you know, the, the spike in MPS from training? Yeah, so... Uh... People always say like, oh, nutrition is uh, is 80% of what makes you grow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> depending on how you want to express it, that's either completely wrong or an underestimation. Uh, I do think that very good training and moderate nutrition is a lot better than very good nutrition and uh, poor training. Because with poor training, you make like your noob gains in the first three months and then you just plateau. And overfeeding on protein or whatever is not going to turn you in Ronnie, into Ronnie Coleman. Uh, however, what's very clear in research is that uh, you simply need uh, your building blocks for muscle to grow. So if you don't eat protein, it's just impossible to be in a positive muscle protein balance. So either you say that nutrition is 100% because without protein, you're not growing or Nutrition is 20% and training is 80% because you simply need training in the long term to do something with your protein. Um, but ultimately, it's it's again it's the same thing that people know for the for the long term uh, effects on muscle mass. You need your caloric balance. Uh, if you eat too little calories, muscle protein synthesis rates will be uh, diminished. Uh, muscle protein synthesis is an energetic, expensive process. So if your body thinks it's starving, uh, it's not going to prioritize muscle protein synthesis. However, uh, a lot of people have looked at the data and then said like, oh, it's impossible to gain muscle mass while in a caloric deficit. That's not true. It just, it's a little bit harder. Uh, less of your energy is directed to muscle protein synthesis, but it's pretty clear that even in a caloric deficit, even if our subjects are fasted for quite some time, uh, they can still uh, get a quite a big increase in muscle protein synthesis. And long-term studies have pretty convincingly shown that even in a caloric deficit, you can build uh, muscle mass. So while caloric intake is important and you for optimal muscle mass gains, you want to have at least caloric balance, uh, it's, it's decrease in uh, in caloric intake is it's a small it has a small detrimental effect on muscle protein synthesis but it's not gonna uh, inhibit it completely more acutely just on a meal to meal basis uh, it's really the protein intake per meal that determines the muscle protein synthetic response just as what we discussed with uh, exercise it's really a dial just uh, a few grams of protein will already result in a uh, significant increase in muscle protein synthesis. And muscle protein synthesis pretty much goes up uh, linearly uh, to doses of about 20 grams of high quality protein. Uh, then doubling protein from about 20 to 40 grams gives another 10 to 20% further increase in muscle protein synthesis. Whether that's worth it or not really depends on the target population, I would say. Most people would say double the protein amount for just 10 to 20% extra. That's probably not worth it. Uh, anyone who goes to the gym multiple times a week probably says 
well, I can get at least 10, 10% more for just a little bit more protein, I'll take it. Uh, so I have no opinion on what's the optimal protein intake. I think it really depends on your goal, but it's probably somewhere between 20 to get the most bang for your buck or 40 grams of high quality protein to really optimize it uh, per meal. However, um, that's high quality protein. So then most animal-based protein sources uh, are what we consider high quality protein uh, sources. They have a very high essential amino acid content, especially the leucine content, which is the amino acid that's most potent at stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Uh, Animal-based products have several issues. One of them is that they have that lower amino acid content, but they also uh, have a very unbalanced amino acid content. So they might have a reasonable total amount of amino acids, but then just one amino acid, they might be almost completely lacking. So an, an analogy I like there is that if you're trying to build a house and you have like an unlimited supply of bricks, an unlimited supply, uh, supply of windows and uh, let's say a roof, uh, but you have no doors, you can't build a functional house. Anyone can walk in, steal your stuff, the weather can get in. And it's kind of the same with muscle. If you have, uh, if you lack one of the essential amino acids, you simply can't produce a functional muscle protein. So you can try to eat more plant-based protein to compensate, but if uh, if one of those plant sources is so low in a specific amino acid, even doubling the amount is not gonna, gonna do a whole lot because two times nothing is still nothing. Uh, so one strategy uh, to augment the response to uh, plant-based proteins might be to mix different plant-based sources together so that they balance out each other's uh, amino acid profile. One source might be low in uh, one amino acid, the other one might be high in that amino acid, so they balance each other out. So generally the advice is if you eat plant-based uh, protein, try to eat at least 20% more protein per meal than recommendations for high quality protein, and ideally mix at least two plant-based sources together. Uh, and then more recent, uh, a lot of research has uh, shifted to uh, more whole foods or even mixed meals. Um, the initial research has really been done on protein supplements just because that's the easiest, to be honest. Uh, if I just give you a shake, I know exactly what's in there. I know the amount. I know you can finish it in two minutes. If I give you a meal with chicken, you might eat it in four minutes and someone else might take 12 minutes. One person might bite his meal more. Um, so supplements are just a lot more practical than uh, than whole foods. But now we start doing it simply because we know most of the things that there are, or at least we think about supplements. And what you see with the whole foods is they're slightly, uh, they slightly digesting at a slower rate, but there may be some other nutrients in whole foods that also stimulate uh, muscle protein synthesis. And that is yeah, basically an entirely new uh, new topic. So we know that carbohydrates have no impact on muscle protein synthesis. Fat, it's not entirely clear. There are some studies where fat seems to have a positive impact, some no impact, some uh, detrimental impact, might depend on the type of fat. Uh, but generally, it's we, we kind of assume that uh, other than protein, the two other macronutrients don't have that much impact. Uh, but now we're starting to look at are there certain micronutrients who can stimulate muscle protein synthesis because that would yeah, open up a whole new field of research. So if you combine this all together, recommendations are to distribute your protein intake uh, throughout the day, three to four big meals. Uh, and each of these meals, you ideally have at least 20 grams of protein, because that's more or less uh, the dose at which you get the biggest bang for your buck. If you really wanna optimize your gains, you probably wanna increase that protein intake up to 40 grams per meal. Ideally, during your three meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, uh, and dinner, you want rapidly digesting protein because that is gonna give you the biggest increase in MPS. 
maybe not uh, a super long muscle protein synthetic response, but that's not really an issue because just a couple hours later, you have your next meal. However, pre-sleep, uh, there is some suggestion that perhaps there you want slow digesting protein uh, because that will last you the entire night, which can easily be seven, eight, nine, ten hours still till your next uh, meal, your breakfast. Uh, however, that's not very clearly been researched. We know that a large dose of slow digesting protein pre-sleep can stimulate overnight muscle protein synthesis. How that compares to other types of proteins, we don't really know. Um, some people like to express uh, protein intakes uh, per body weight. Uh, quick disclaimer there. I think there's not real strong convincing evidence uh, that it should be expressed per body weight. It makes sense, uh, but there's some counter arguments that I won't go into now. My only concern is I'm fine with expressing it per body weight, especially if you're big, because if you're big, maybe you need more and then you don't want these recommendations that are based on, let's call it average people. But if you're smaller than the subjects that have been used in, uh, in studies, expressing it per body weight might underestimate it. So especially if you're smaller than the average study subject, which is usually around 70 kilograms, so that will be uh, 155 pounds, uh, I would be careful of expressing your protein intakes per body weight because for you it might underestimate it. But a good number uh, expressed as body weight is 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram per day divided in about four meals would be 0.4 uh, grams per kilogram per meal. Awesome, awesome. That was very, very thorough. So I guess now that we know the strategies that which we can use for training and diet to get the most out of uh, efforts in the gym and to get as big as humanly possible, what are some things that can impede muscle protein synthesis? So um, you know, are there particular um, macronutrients, uh, training styles, um, you know, uh, what factors can uh, diminish the amount of uh, protein that we uh, synthesize through resistance training? Um, so there's one macronutrient, alcohol, unfortunately, that uh, impairs muscle protein synthesis. Um, to be fair, there's only one good study on that topic, and that, stu uh, that study gives like 12 uh, standard uh, alcoholic drinks. Uh, what's funny is that standard alcoholic drinks uh, are different in every country, um, but to make it easy for your listeners, uh, although they, they are probably all over the world, it was an Australian study, <laughs> so it's 12 Australian drinks. Um, now you think that's, wow, that's so extreme, no one ever does it, but they did it because they uh, they did other studies where they looked at alcohol intake into athletes, and you see that most team sports, that's actually the amount that they drink in team sports. So think of soccer players, they have their match, and then they're all going to the bar together, and then they drink on average 12 drinks. How did they pass that um, through an ethics board? That's my question. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I know, I, well, I think it's because it's an Australian ethics board. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's it. Now, uh, well, so ethics are so different all over the world. Like I've I've seen it, seen them at a couple of places. I've seen places where you hand in like four pages, and that's your ethics application. And well, I know how it's here, and it's like two hundred pages. So rules are just completely different everywhere. Uh, I don't think we would be able to do it here. But regardless, for our audience, most lifters, they would never drink uh, 12 glasses. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't listen to this podcast. However, there are quite a few people who like to drink like one glass of wine or two glasses of wine with dinner. So I would be quite interested in uh, what's the effect of that. Because if you only have like two data points, like, no alcohol and 12 and 12 is bad. You don't really know the relation between those points. So is it like you need a minimal alcohol amount in your blood before it starts having any detrimental effects? Or maybe the first two glasses 
give you like 80% of the negative effects. And then, yeah, once you've had two, you might as well have 12. It's almost the same. Or is it actually linear? And in that case, one drink is, I guess, acceptable. Um, so I think we need some dose response uh, work on that. Most likely, my assumption would be that it's linear, but you don't really know. So that's nutrition wise. Uh, again, uh, a prolonged energy deficit will reduce muscle protein synthesis. Uh, well, everyone who's ever dieted knows it. Uh, again, you can build muscle mass while dieting. It's just a little bit harder. Um, then there's some other physiological factors. Um, the best known one is simply aging. Again, that's no surprise. Uh, older people lose muscle mass. And uh, the reason why is that, so we discussed that about 20 grams of protein gives like the near maximal increase in muscle protein synthesis in healthy young guys. Uh, in older people, that same 20 grams of protein gives a much lower increase in muscle protein synthesis. So we call that anabolic resistance, which I always thought had something to do with anabolics when I was an undergraduate. Uh, but it just means that uh, the elderly body doesn't respond positively to anabolic stimuli like nutrition and exercise. So elderly need a lot more protein to get the same muscle protein synthetic response as younger people. Uh, probably at least 30 grams of high quality protein, maybe even a little bit more. Um, so that's aging. Uh, it might be a little bit surprising to some listeners that uh, sex doesn't really seem to uh, induce anabolic resistance. Females respond just as well to exercise and nutrition as men do. Uh, females just start with a lot lower muscle mass than men do. But they can gain pretty much at the same rate. Of course, if you have a tiny girl, uh, a 10% increase in muscle mass is still less of an absolute increase than when a huge guy starts working out. But relatively, they pretty much gain uh, at the same rate. Uh, another, well, probably, no, not probably, the strongest uh, factor that induces anabolic resistance is muscle tissues. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about, oh, I'm going, on a holiday for a week oh my god all my gains are going because then you're still walking around you're still supporting your body weight that's really not that bad uh, especially if you have some periodized training program where you have had a heavy week taking a week off is no big deal but when we talk about muscle tissues we mean complete muscle tissues so there's pretty much two models we use for that that's either complete bed rest uh, so someone is so sick they can't leave their bed so there's just no uh, no resistance, no weight on their legs at all. And then you see a very dramatic uh, decrease in muscle mass. And you can feed them all the protein that you want. You still see some muscle protein synthesis, but it's so much lower than uh, just in normal people or people who work out. So if there's no exercise stimulus, the muscle just loses almost all its sensitivity for protein. Protein kind of becomes useless without some form of exercise. Uh, and the other, uh, perhaps more relevant for athletes, is uh, when you break a limb, for example, and it's constant and you simply can't move uh, that limb after just one or two weeks uh, and the cast comes off, you like visually see like two completely different legs. There's just a dramatic uh, reduction in muscle mass. So those are the, the main factors that can induce anabolic resistance. Uh, ideally, you try to prevent them all, especially aging. <laughs> <laughs> no, awesome, man. And the final topic I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Jorn, is uh, based on an article you published in November 2018 um, on the weaknesses of muscle hypertrophy studies. And we sort of touched on uh, one of those weaknesses uh, earlier on in um, you know, being able to fractionate um, you know, the differences in a protein synthesis. Uh, but what are some of the other weaknesses uh, in hypertrophy studies? Yeah, so like 
as I mentioned, we're really known uh, for muscle protein synthesis. So people think we're in love with muscle protein synthesis, but we have all the equipment to do only long-term studies if we wanted to. Uh, there's a reason why we do like most of our research budget, so to speak, goes into these acute studies rather than these long-term studies. Uh, and the reason is that unless a long-term study is done well, it just gives uh, it, it just a natural tendency of those studies is to give the wrong conclusion. So let me give you a very practical example. You take five guys, you uh, you give them your training program. I take five guys, I give them my training program. We're going to measure muscle mass gains tomorrow, and we're going to see who who has uh, who is the master, the authority of muscle muscle mass gains. Uh, well, there's going to be no difference in muscle mass gains because it's one day. It's just stupid, right? So we measure them again. A week later, they have now done three, four, five training sessions. Uh, are we going to see any difference uh, differences in muscle mass gains between those groups? No. Like it's one week. What do you expect? So they continue to train uh, for, let's say, a month. Uh, again, there's no differences in muscle mass gains. It's just way too short. So they train three months. Do you now see a difference in muscle mass gains between our groups? So let's say that my training program, because I'm, ooh, I'm so smart, uh, is 10% better than your training program. That is just not enough to have what's called a statistically significant difference between groups. So the, the difference in muscle mass just has to accumulate over time to become big enough to, this is a simplification, but just for the statistics to say like, oh, this is no coincidence, this program is clearly better than the other one. It just takes a lot of time. So the issue with a lot of uh, muscle growth studies is they are way too short and then they say, well, it doesn't seem to be that there's a difference. And that's true, like in six weeks, you don't see a really, you don't really see a measurable difference but that doesn't mean those training programs produce the same results. Uh, one group was 10% better than the other one, but just in that time frame, that doesn't amount to anything. But if those groups would have trained for six months or for one year, the one group would simply be 10% better than the other group. But 10% over six weeks, it's nothing. Uh, so duration of uh, studies is a major issue. And then I come back to the point we said earlier, there, there's not many companies or governments that are interested in funding big training studies because there's no money to be earned with training, so to speak, at least not from a government point of view or a company point of view. So it's not that researchers don't know this principle, they just they don't have the resources to do these long term studies. Another issue is uh, the sample size. So even somehow if your five guys trained for a year, my five guys trained for a year, my guys gain 10% more than your guys, I'm gonna say, see, I'm shit, <laughs> everyone, do my online coaching, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna say, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, that's, <laughs> exactly. where, that's where your logo should just appear in the back. Please, please don't, I'm not, I'm not looking for anyone, go to Jacob. Uh, I'm not looking for anyone so, either, man. <laughs> So um, uh, even if they would train for a year, my guys do 10% better than your guys. You're going to say, well, you guys are Dutch. Like you're tall motherfuckers. You all have, can I say that? You all yeah. have like the best uh, genetics. You just got your five best genetic freaks. Uh, I'm not convinced that your training program was actually better. It's just five guys. Maybe it's just genetics or whatever. Maybe you guys have less stress, sleep more. You have all these dairy cows in the Netherlands. Uh, it's just not very convincing, right? Now, it would be different if I had 500 guys and you had 500 guys. That same argument no longer flies. Like, clearly, that's nonsense. I, I'm not going to find 500 genetic freaks compared to you. So that's another issue uh, that statistics, uh, they play by exactly the same rules. When there's, even when there appears to be a difference between two groups, if the sample size is small or just a few subjects, your statistics say like, yeah, maybe there's a difference. I'm just not sure whether the difference in training protocols is the real reason. So I'm going to be conservative and I'm going to say there's no significant difference because I'm not entirely convinced it was a training. So duration, 
is a major factor. The number of subjects is a major factor. Uh, a third big one is the actual uh, method of measuring muscle mass. So uh, you can uh, use a DEXA scan, for example. Uh, probably people who read research are familiar with that one, but it's like the most basic, also probably the poorest, cheapest version there is for a research perspective. Don't get me wrong, if you're a competitor and you have the ability to do like a DEXA scan every three months, that's pretty great. But as a researcher, I'm not impressed when a study only uses a DEXA scan. If you do, for example, a whole body MRI scan, I don't even want to know how much that costs. Uh, I don't even want to think about how many hours it costs to analyze one of those subjects because you make like a segment at every part of the body. Uh, but it's just so much more sensitive. So an analogy is if, if I have a skill, I step on it, let's say I'm uh, 200 pounds, I step off it, I step on it again, I'm 210 pounds. The measurement is just all over the place. So even if I lose five pounds in a week, the skill might say you're heavier. It's the same with measurement tools. If you have a measurement tool that always have like quite a bit of variance, it's not super accurate it's just very difficult to say like oh your training program was 10 percent better than jacobs so unless a study is long has enough subjects and good measurements uh there's just a pretty big chance that it comes to the conclusion like i'm not convinced there is a difference between groups so by the statistical rules you have to say there's no significant difference which people then read as, oh, both groups are the same. So doesn't matter if you train like this or this. Timing difference doesn't matter. Uh, whatever you want to compare, protein quality, it doesn't matter. But again, if, you, if you're if you simplifying things like that, uh, you're just missing out on quite a bit. Uh, all those studies say, like, with a few subjects over a short period with a relatively poor uh, measurement tool. I can't be super convinced that one was clearly much better than the other one. That's your conclusion. But one might still be, might be 10, 15, 20, 25 percent better than the other one, which in the real world is a lot. If you can outtrain your competition or whatever by 25 percent, that's use. But showing that in a study, that's really difficult and again it would be simple if we just like give me enough money and i can do all the perfect studies with the right answer uh, it's just a money issue and unfortunately uh, there's quite a few of labs out there who have like very little budget so they still do the studies but like the studies were kind of doomed before they even began because just they're too short too weak, uh, poor measurements, and just by the statistical rules, they're kind of doomed to conclude there's no significant difference. And it, in my opinion, it only gives the wrong impression uh, to readers who are not uh, aware of statistics. And usually those researchers, they maybe they know it, there was a statistical issue, but they don't really want to describe it in their paper because it makes their paper look weak. Mm -hmm. So... It's a little bit of a tricky situation. Now there is some, it's now it sounds like, oh, we're never gonna find out the small things. There is uh, one upside. Uh, all data is valuable because if you gain more and more data, at some point you can combine it all. And then what you essentially do is you take 20 studies that are all of a poor quality, but when you combine them together in a meta-analysis, what you're kind of doing is making one big good study of all that data. So the danger is that every time one of those studies comes out, like I see pretty much once or twice a month, I see a study that says, oh, eating more protein doesn't help with muscle mass gains. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, everyone knows that, that this conclusion is wrong. But every time those studies come out, it's more data for the meta-analysis. So when a new meta-analysis comes out, uh, it just, that meta-analysis will now have 200 subjects in 
three years, it will have 400 subjects, and then it can come to a better conclusion. Uh, now, I don't want to bore people too much with statistics. Meta-analysis have their own drawbacks, but uh, all I want to say is not all hope is lost. Just be very careful when you read there's no significant differences between groups. One group might still be doing better than the other one. Awesome, man. And for listeners, if they want to find you and not be coached by you, where should they look um, and how can they stay up to date with your work? Yeah, so I have a, a website, Nutrition Tactics. Uh, I use that on most of my social uh, social media. So if you just look for Nutrition Tactics, then hopefully you can find me. I'm mostly active on Instagram where I make like infographics. Uh, I always try to do some YouTube stuff, but I never get around to it because then the boss comes in with a new study ID and then that has a priority. So uh, I try to be around. Uh, Ask me cool questions, uh, and I might uh, be triggered to be more on social media. Otherwise, I'm just in the lab writing away. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. And guys, uh, be sure to check out Jorn's work. Uh, he does put out a lot of really informative content, and he's doing some pretty cool things uh, in his research. So, yeah, check him out. Thanks for listening, guys, and we'll speak to you all next time.